Uh, <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us uh, joining us today. Uh, I find it a bit ironic that uh, I'm presenting on non-communicable diseases and I'm competing with the sugar and caffeine that's outside right now. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll go with the people that uh, we have here now. I'm very excited for our presenters today um, to learn a bit more about uh, NCD use cases in country. Um, yeah, I will just click this here. Uh, my name is Brian O'Donnell. I'm a DHIS2 implementer at the University of Oslo at the HISP Center, where I work on the uh, Global Health Content and Standards team, producing um, packages, for example, and providing other DHIS2 technical assistance. But um, I, I have a few introductory uh, slides to go through, but um, I will hear shortly from some NCD use cases from both uh, Nigeria and Indonesia. Um, and I will present them in due time. Um, so first, just to set the scene, um, I want to leave some space for questions. So I'll, I apologize if I go through this a bit fast. But uh, Sustainable Development Goal 3.4 says that by 2030, uh, we should reduce by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment. I put up this slide here so that everyone is on the same page about what non-communicable diseases are how they differ from infectious diseases, and they also understand a bit of the burden. So this is a world burden of disease by cause uh, around the world using a disability adjusted life, life years or dailies. I'm sure most of the people joining us are familiar with these terms, but um, to understand globally that cardiovascular diseases and cancers are the leading causes of death. Um, but also if you were to break this down by region or by country, then the uh, burden of disease by cause for um, lower middle income countries, for example, is actually going down uh, greatly for infectious diseases such as or, or neonatal disorders or um, enteritic infections, and it's increasing over time for uh, non-communicable diseases. So you can see that each year more than 15 million people die from an NCD between the ages of 30 and 69 years and 85% of these premature deaths occur in low and middle income countries. Um, I also bring up this uh, point because while, um, while NCD's uh, burden is increasing around the world, our health information architectures were largely designed around infectious disease programs, right? So we still have these different programs for HIV, TB, malaria, collecting data in their own silos and for specific use cases. Um, but as NCDs increase their burden globally, we might see a shift in health information systems towards more focus on a uh, burden of NCDs and providing uh, care for patients with uh, hypertension and diabetes or other types of uh, respiratory and cardiovascular disorders. So um, there was actually a NCD hard talks put on by the WHO just a few uh, weeks ago that said so far the global response to NCDs is a test that we have failed. Um, so it's uh, quite a large step to say that uh, we are failing a test and we need to get back on track. And while tobacco use is down, almost all other indicators for um, NCDs are on the rise. And I think that we will see a, um, a large increase in investments uh, for digital health into NCDs over the next short to medium term because of that. Um, so what are we doing at uh, HISP UIO as uh, in our partnership with WHO around NCDs? Um, well, there is an integrated NCD package for HMIS that we are working on with the uh, WHO NCD program, including the uh, hearts indicators of the WHO technical package. And since 2020, we've been um, putting together a, um, a, 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 a global product for NCDs, for collecting data on NCDs at the facility level. And that included a rapid landscaping of uh, the HISP network, um, which revealed that really the NCD indicators are not included in many HMIS systems that we work with. Um, and furthermore, that a lot of the key NCD indicators rely on a longitudinal follow-up of chronic uh, diseases which are quite challenging to implement. So oftentimes you find, might find yourself in a, uh, in a aggregate system or an event capture system for, um, for infectious diseases. But then for, um, for these chronic uh, diseases, uh, you might need a, 
a, a much longer time horizon to capture data for patients with hypertension, for example, right? Um, and one of the things I'd like to put up there as well is this um, WHO HISPIN uh, Resolve to Save Lives partnership in Bangladesh, which is piloting, collecting individual level data uh, through another application and then importing it into DHIS2. So um, all of this talk about mobile health applications being used to track things like, um, like uh, blood pressure or diabetes. How can we actually integrate those tools into the health management information system? Um, we also have a rehabilitation package, which is related to NCDs as well, which has been recently published. I won't go into a lot of detail on that, but just a short plug if you're interested. Uh, a number of countries have expressed interest in um, finding a standard set of indicators for um, personnel density utilization um, of different, um, different products around rehabilitation. Um, but really this, this session is about learning from country use cases. And that's kind of the same approach that we're taking right now with the metadata packages and our collaboration with WHO. So we have a number of different work streams for informing this uh, package development. Um, we'll hear today from, um, from Joseph about the resolve to save lives work on the, the hypertension screening app um, in Nigeria. And then um, they also work in Bangladesh. Um, we're also talking with the World Diabetes Foundation about uh, their work around a digital co diabetes compass um, and exploring possible uses of DHIS2 tracker around diabetes screening. And uh, HISP Rwanda also has a couple of programs that are of interest if you um, are in the NCD space, particularly around um, integrating um, a DHIS2 tracker with the desktop application called CanReg5 which is used to analyze cancer data um, and is used in a number of facilities in different contexts. Um, there's also a national NCD screening program that HISP Rwanda is doing around a number of these different NCDs. Um, but with that, I will turn it to our first uh, speaker um, to give the a presentation. Um, Mr. Joseph Odu is a technical advisor for monitoring and evaluation at Resolve to Save Lives uh, country office in Nigeria. And he will be sharing a bit about the um, about the hypertension screening application and the program there. So can I stop screen sharing here? I don't want to share screen. So sorry. Um, Joseph, can you share your screen? Yes, about to do that. All right, thank you. Okay. Brian? Yeah, we uh we can't see your screen yet. Um okay. you had it earlier. Yes, I'm trying to get it up and uh, okay, found it. Great. Thank so, you. Um, can you see it now? Yes, just put it on presentation mode. Oh, okay. Great. Um, I, I like your presentation because it set the stage for mine. And um, I think most of my background has been <laughs> taken care of by you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you, everyone. Good day. And um, like Brian said, my name is Joseph Odu. And um, I'll be speaking to this presentation titled DHIS2 at the scale of hypertension lessons learned so far in Nigeria. I'll be speaking on behalf of a team from the Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria, the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, WHO Nigeria Country Office, HISP Nigeria, and Resolve to Save Lives. And our presentation will take this format, the background of our projects, our approach uh, for the deployment of DHIS2 on our project, the lessons we've learned, and also our next steps. So, the Nigerian Hypertension Control Initiative, which was formerly known as the National Hypertension Control Initiative, was birthed in Nigeria in November of 2020 in Kano states and Ogun states. Those are the two pilot states for this initiative. Kano is in the northern part of Nigeria, while Ogun is in the southern part of Nigeria. This intervention was um, first piloted in 12 facilities for over a year, and during this time, the inter this initiative was led by the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. 
I'll talk about their individual roles on the next slide. And during this period, the management of data was primarily paper-based, which was in alignment to the national um, management information system in country. And why was this initiative better? It was to reduce the morbidity and mortality from cardiovascular diseases at the primary healthcare level in Nigeria. For those of you who are familiar with the Nigerian healthcare system, management of cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension is primarily the focus of tertiary facilities and secondary facilities. It was not uh, within the remit of primary healthcare facilities. However, looking at the burden of hypertension and cardiovascular disease in Nigeria, where one out of every three Nigerians has uncontrolled blood pressure and also uh, cardiovascular diseases res being responsible for 11% of the deaths in Nigeria, of which hypertension is the major risk factor, the Federal Ministry of Health thought it wise to bring the management of hypertension closer to the doorsteps of our households in Nigeria, thereby creating an enabling environment to capacitate primary health care centers to manage hypertension. That is one of the major successes of this initiative so far. We've worked with partners to develop a national hypertension treatment guideline, and we've also ensured that there is access to high quality comprehensive hypertension diagnosis and treatment using the WHO HATS package. And we've also ensured the availability of validated um, sphygmomanometers for um, measuring blood pressure and also availability of drugs. We've also worked with partners such as HISP to ensure that there's a functional information management system to cater to these hypertensive patients. So who are the players in this initiative? The initiative is led, just like I said earlier, by the Federal Ministry of Health. They are responsible for the policy making uh, duty in the health ministry. Then the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, who are responsible for the day-to-day -day running of primary health centers in Nigeria. And technical partners are WHO and also HISP. WHO takes um, sole responsibility of providing technical support in service delivery and drug management, while HISP supports with data management, resolve to save lives at the funders and also provide technical support to the initiative. Currently, we have over 13,000 patients being managed with the help of DHIS2. We scaled from 24 facilities. Currently, we have 104 facilities using DHIS2 to manage their patients in both Kano and Ogle states. This is a big fit for us, and we're excited about this. But before this achievement, what was the case? Just like I mentioned, um, the prevalence of um, hypertension in Nigeria is about slightly over 31%. And so, Imagine managing patients, about 30% of the population with a paper-based system. And these patients will manage throughout their lifetime. As we know, hypertension management using DHIS2 is a longitudinal uh, process. So this um, has been envisioned to um, lead to reporting burden at facility levels. In Nigeria, we have a national health management information system that manages data for most of the programs. However, we still have some standalone uh, management systems. Our PHCs are understaffed, and some of most of the staff are um, not so motivated. Now, bringing a hypertension treatment program that is being piloted that requires them to use um, new tools that they will be trained on seemed to look like a burden, and also took away from the time required to manage patients. As a result of the increased workload, this, affect, this affected the quality of the data that was submitted at the end of each reporting period and also delayed availability of uh, data that's been processed for decision makers to inform uh, programs at both state, national, and at the facility level. So these were the reasons why the partnership that's co-implementing this National Hypertension Control Initiative decided to come together and see how best to make life easy for the healthcare providers at the facility level to ensure that there's high quality data for decision making and to ensure that we have a good picture of the hypertension uh, burden in Nigeria. So what did we do? We held several meetings, the Federal Ministry of Health, WHO, NPHCDA, HISP Nigeria, and Resolve to Save Lives, first met to conceptualize the idea 
and see how best to present this case to um, stakeholders for their buy-in. And having had successful meetings and firmed up our plans, we met with the Department of Health Planning Research and Statistics in the Federal Ministry of Health, worked with them to come up with a blueprint for the deployment of DHIS2. First of all, we held a co-creation workshop to agree with uh, implementing partners, development partners, um, healthcare providers, and even beneficiaries on the indicators we wanted to showcase on this platform because we had simplicity at the back of our mind. So we focused on the WHO HATS indicators following the co-creation workshop. And also because the Federal Ministry of Health was looking towards an integrated program, we agreed on indicators for both hypertension and for diabetes to be deployed through DHIS2. Then a prototype was developed by HISP and UIO, which we then took to the field in November of 2021 and showed the, the healthcare workers. We visited six facilities, three in Ogun and three in Kano, where we talked to 19 healthcare providers, gave them the tools to use in collecting, registering new patients, um, recalling page, uh, patient data manually, recalling data using a QR code, and also for entering data for follow-up patients. We observed that on the average, it took about four minutes to capture data or register a new client, and a minute to um, enter data for follow-up uh, patients. So these learnings and all the findings we got, we transferred to HISP and UIO to use for upgrading the device. Following the upgrade to the device, we trained a critical mass of stakeholders at the national level, where we had a tiered level of training. So we had a TOT. We trained uh, staff from the Ministry, Federal Ministry of Health. We trained uh, staff from WHO, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. And when we got the critical um, mass of trainers, we rolled down to, cascaded down to the states, where we trained the states and also the facility staff. Following the trainings, we then deployed DHIS2 in our initial 24 facilities, 12 in Kano and 12 in Ogun. Following the deployment and um, a form of uh, secondary pilot, we then rolled out to all 104 facilities in, uh, on the project. In the design of the DHIS2 uh, tracker for longitudinal tracking of patients on the NATI, we learned from an existing electronic data management tool called Simple used by RTSL in four countries, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and uh, I think that's a, the fourth country doesn't come to mind now, where they are managing 2 million patients on the Simple app. We asked and tried to find out what was the reason, what were the success factors. We found out that the fact that the app was fast and easy to use enabled its prompt uptake and why was it fast? Because there was, it was tracking very few critical indicators, therefore not inundating um, healthcare workers with a lot of data elements for data entry, and also ensuring that there was priority indicators available for decision makers. And also the fact that the simple app was uh, able to uh, work offline and looking at Nigerian context where we have operational challenges like limited power supply to ensure that the devices are always charged and on, and on stable internet connectivity. These were features that we ensured that our DHIS2 app had. And we worked with the HISP team to transfer these learnings from simple to our DHIS2 tracker. So what did we learn? We've um, stratified our learnings into two. The first are the potential inhibitors. So we've come here to share with colleagues um, who intend to use DHIS2 tracker for longitudinal tracking of hypertension cases, that it is very important to have a well thought out and coordinated uh, plan for transitioning data from paper-based tools into the DHIS2 platform. Prior to deployment of DHIS2, we had about 7,000 patients that were already on the program. And you recall that management of hypertension is a lifelong process. So it is very important that we transfer the legacy data already captured on the paper-based tool into DHIS2 so that we can recall or healthcare workers can recall them during subsequent visits 
and provide um, appropriate care and to ensure continuum of care. So one of the lessons we learned is if this handshake between the paper-based tools and the DHIS2 tracker is not well coordinated, there'll be several technical glitches when the migration has, um, has been done and recalling patients when they visit for follow-up will be very challenging. We had some challenges such as this at the beginning. And one of such is during deployment, we had DHIS 2.5 version. So it was a version control crisis. And that version promptly told us whenever there was a sync error, if the data was uploaded. However, when some of those, uh, when the new facilities came on board and they had 2.6, 2.6 was not as, um, for want of a better word, I would say sensitive to picking some of the sync errors. And we've been able to identify some of these errors. And with the help of His Nigeria and UIO, we are trying to sort out these um, challenges that we faced. So we would like um, others who want to use DHIS2 for this kind of uh, programming to ensure that this handshake is almost flawless, if not flawless, to ensure that you don't have such technical challenges. Secondly, we have the enabling factors. The fact, the lesson we learned from uh, simple was further buttressed because when we deployed DHIS2, considering that we have minimal data elements to go to be imputed into the device, encourage healthcare workers to um, uptake, I mean, to um, use DHIS2 more than we had expected. They were only collecting data on the patient's demography, only on patient's um, medication and blood pressure very minimal data. Other, the other data elements were either automated or considered not very uh, important for this. And so we made their life very easy. Also, um, traditionally in, uh, in Nigeria, when programs use electronic data uh, management, use electronic tools or devices, they procure these devices for the uh, healthcare workers. However, during our user acceptance testing, we tried to disrupt this process by um, engaging the healthcare workers to see if they would allow us to use their devices. Most were excited to do this on the condition that we provided data, which we're happy to provide. However, I would like us to know that this was not without challenges because some of the healthcare workers have devices who do not have enough storage capacity, and this was a challenge. However, it saved the program a lot of um, costs and it's an area that the country is really interested in exploring to see how going forward, we would uh, leverage devices of healthcare workers based on uh, the learnings we get from this. Another, the last lesson was the active engagement of stakeholders as a very veritable tool in ensuring the success of our implementation thus far. Some of the challenges we had were promptly uh, surmounted because the states were part of the design of this program. They were part of the in intervention all through and they took ownership of it. So they supported us in ensuring that um, most of the challenges we faced were, over were overcome. So overall, these are the three enabling factors that we've learned so far following deployment of DHIS2 from October, 2022 to date. We would also like to share some of the next steps that we have. We are currently working to ensure that we document all the lessons that we've learned in this process. And we hope to share this with UIO, HISP, and WHO, that this um, process is something that is scalable, is something that other climbs and other countries and other programs can use. And we are also going to continue to advocate for the seamless transition to 100% electronic data management of NCD cases, where there will be no use of paper, there will be sole use of um, DHIS2. Because we've seen that it takes the healthcare workers four minutes to collect data and register new patients, and one minute to enter data for new, uh, I mean, for revisit patients, as against using paper tools that are prone to several challenges, like we all are familiar with. We would like to show you the interface of um, our DHIS2 tracker. So you see that it just gets the patient's name, date of birth. I mean, the patient's date of birth, it automatically calculates the age, the patient's phone, phone number and address so that we can follow up. 
There's a QR code that can be scanned to recall patient information, the blood pressure uh, reading measurement, the drugs, and then the dates for the follow-up visits. So this is what our DHIS2 tracker um, data captures. Then this is what our um, dashboard shows. It shows us the number of patients that have been enrolled. It shows us the number of patients that whose blood pressure are controlled and also to shows us our cohorts control over time. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to further engagements. Thanks a lot, Joseph. Um, I want to leave a time for uh, the team from Indonesia to present next, but is there anyone who has a quick question and then we can maybe take more questions at the end? No? Okay, if uh, there are no questions then we can proceed to the next one. And uh, Joseph, if you, can, if you can hold on in case there's any questions uh, towards the end. Um, but we're now joined by um, our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Guardian Y. Sanjaya is a senior implementer of DHIS2 from the University of Gajamada in Indonesia. And he will be presenting um, on the use of DHIS2 tractor for disease registration. So um, Dr. Sanjaya, off to you. Yeah, yeah. thank you, uh, <clears throat> Brian. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear my Yes. Yeah. So the screen is already uh, shared. It, can you see the screens? Yes. Okay. See screen. okay. okay great. Uh, uh, me and my colleague uh, Fifi will uh, present uh, our works uh, experience experiments um, <clears throat> to use the DAS2 tracker for disease registrations, and uh, this is really to support the clinical research uh, involving uh, different uh, hospitals, uh, uh, especially in in. Uh, 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 in Indonesia, uh, third, uh, third level of hospital in Indonesia. And uh, what we want to uh, share is uh, related to these uh, registrations uh, that defined by the clinicians, uh, which is uh, relatively different with, uh, for example, like uh, HIV registry or uh, <clears throat> uh, malaria registry or immunization registry. And uh, we try because we already implemented the AES2 since 2017, and uh, we would like to use the, the AES2 as a clinical data management software to facilitate the clinicians uh, to uh, collect the data related to the disease registrations, uh, specific disease registrations. And uh, several, uh, I think, uh, as, uh, the the step is almost similar with uh, other uh, implementation in many uh, countries. And uh, we want to uh, specifically share our uh, implementation challenge uh, that uh, maybe uh, we can get input from uh, all of you uh, that already implement this uh, DAS2 as a disease registry. I saw that uh, Rwanda and also uh, <coughs> other country already uh, developed the similar uh, uh, um, uh, functions of the AES2 for these registrations. And uh, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the disease registrations, uh, which is uh, when uh, we talk with the, uh, the clinicians, uh, they uh, normally call it clinical data management uh, because uh, once uh, the data is actually collected from the medical records, either electronic or non-electronics, uh, many of hospitals in Indonesia also uh, still are using non-electronic this, uh, but uh, and not all the, the data from the medical record is collected for the specific disease because uh, yeah, a, a patients with a cancer, for example, they can come to the hospital because of the COVID-19 or because of uh, other uh, disease. So uh, uh, the, uh, the data uh, uh, also can be collected. Uh, prospectively, uh, since the patient comes uh, firstly come to the hospital, for example, for asthma registry, uh, but also can be a retrospective data collections. In cancer registry, for example, uh, they collect data uh, two years after the patient firstly diagnosed. So uh, they cannot uh, collect the data uh, for the first time because the first time is still uh, uh, under diagnose and uh, still uh, waiting for the treatment, waiting for the uh, other things. So that's why the in cancer registry is uh, most uh, likely is retrospective data collections. And 
uh, sometimes also the disease specific uh, data is beyond the medical records. Uh, they uh, uh, they can uh, they usually also need to collect the primary data from the patient. For example, like uh, the risk factors, uh, environmental factors, and etc. As additional uh, from the medical records, and uh, they have also. Uh, uh, very specific, uh, uh, very systematic data quality checks. Uh, for example, like cancer registry, uh, the enumerator to collect the data, the data manager will review the data and uh, after the data managers and it has to be reviewed by a minimum two of uh, clinicians uh, before it can be used uh, to, uh, uh, to be analyzed. And uh, to represent populations, uh, they need to collaborate with the different hospitals, even though that uh, the data is collected in the, uh, only in the one hospital. So uh, they actually uh, have a site visit to uh, different hospitals uh, and collect the data related to, for example, like cancers. And uh, once the data is collected in other hospital, they, uh, they return it to the main hospital and uh, collect the data in these main hospitals. Uh, and uh, this is um, uh, the way uh, in O1 uh, of, can, uh, of the uh, disease registrations in Indonesia. But the others uh, requires uh, other hospital to uh, collect data directly uh, from their uh, hospitals, not, uh, not uh, uh, the way that uh, the first uh, I mentioned. And uh, sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, because uh, the, the the outcomes uh, the uh, the output of the analysis is uh, to see the outcome of the uh, interventions and sometimes uh, they need to have uh, specific uh, analysis for example like uh, survival analysis where the data should be uh, imported uh, but uh, maybe imported in a specific time of period and then uh, they use it uh, uh, to uh, they, they uh, use uh, different tools to to analyze uh, the data uh, using the statistical tools and uh, we saw that uh, the IES2 uh, as a clinical data management software have uh, uh, many uh, opportunities uh, it can cover the server client for multiple centers and uh, even uh, it can uh, accommodate the continuous data collections, uh, for example, like cancers, uh, even though that uh, the data, the firstly is uh, collected in the this years and uh, the outcomes can be uh, collected in the maybe another uh, two years or another three years. So uh, the clinician can also monitor uh, through the descriptive analysis that uh, they can do it by themselves. Uh, it is self uh, analysis, and uh, uh, data. Uh, the data uh, can be extracted into uh, the Excel format, for example, or uh, text format uh, that they can import it into the statistical tools uh, to be analyzed uh, more uh, uh, appropriately. So that's uh, I think uh, the IES2 give uh, lots of opportunity to to be used uh, as a clinical uh, data management software. But uh, we are facing uh, several uh, challenges, of course, uh, related to the implementations. Uh, the step for the implementation, I think, almost similar with uh, other uh, many uh, other uh, countries or many other uh, 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 developing uh, partners to, to implement the DAES2. We start to identify the data elements. Uh, uh, using uh, the standard form from the global uh, uh, registry, uh, disease registry with a specific disease registry. And then, uh, of course, uh, there are several uh, local SNPs uh, that we need to accommodate, and uh, they are very happy uh, that uh, we can modify the forms, modify uh, the option sets uh, directly. Uh, to the DAS2 and then uh, very dynamic uh, uh, data uh, elements that can build from the DAS2. And of course, uh, 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 we can demonstrate, we demonstrate to them and uh, pro, uh, ask uh, for the input to improve the, the, uh, the forms and also the uh, data elements. Uh, uh, this is the uh, registration disease registration that we uh, develop uh, in collaboration with the different uh, departments uh, uh, in in uh, uh, faculty of medicines and also uh, subject hospital it is third level of hospitals in in Yogyakarta province 
and uh, it's not in the same times uh, the implementations uh, it start from the covid-19 uh, in children's uh, last year's uh, start in april uh, once we show the benefit of using the dis2 and then uh, 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 their colleague from uh, different sub departments asking about how about epilepsy in children how about asthma in children and so on and we uh, always say that okay let's do it and then uh, showing uh, them about the uh, this is the benefit and this is the data you, uh, you already collected and showing the uh, dashboard or analytics they can uh, conduct by themselves, uh, even though this is a descriptive analysis. And uh, we uh, starting from uh, a teaching hospitals, uh, a third level of hospitals in, in uh, Yogyakarta regions. Uh, because they do have a network with other hospitals in the province and also in other provinces, and uh, they start to uh, involve uh, other hospitals, uh, especially in asthma in children. Uh, they, uh, we are collaboration with uh, the pediatric associations uh, that covers uh, eight teaching hospital centers in Indonesia. Uh, so basically, they they uh, they already have the data manager to collect the data uh, or, or enumerators to collect the data, and they can can see the data by themselves and they can analyze the data uh, and they can yeah uh, 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 it's easy uh, uh, for them to uh, to use the electronic base it's not uh, 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 very uh, we, we, we very minor uh, uh, capacity building to uh, uh, with uh, them because uh, they are already familiar with the uh, different uh, electronic forms, so uh, it's easy for them to follow the the DIS2 uh, uh, data collection tools. And this is uh, examples of the uh, dashboard uh, from the COVID-19 in children and uh, many other dashboards uh, we develop uh, and uh, they can develop by themselves, uh, especially uh, uh for the uh, asthma and cancer registry uh, what are the challenges uh, during the implementations uh, once uh, uh, synthesizing data from the medical record this is uh, from their uh, part they are not from the uh, the dis2 or the technical part because uh, not all the uh, data that uh, already in the electronic and non-electronic uh, medical record uh, it is uh, should be uh, inputted into the uh, uh, clinical data uh, management software. So uh, basically, some uh, maybe some some of the uh, information should be synthesized by themselves, and they have to interpret uh, by themselves which uh, particular data elements is suit uh, that to be collected into the uh, the DIS two, and. Uh, uh, teaching hospital because we work with the teaching hospitals, uh, tertiary care, uh, uh, where they receive a patient from multiple uh, district uh, and maybe different uh, province as well. Uh, and uh, when we want to uh, create the visualization in in maps, uh, we have to process separately. So we have to uh, put uh, we have to extract that into the aggregate data and then uh, we put it into the profin, uh, districts uh, levels uh, data entry forms. Uh, but this is only important the data, not not much uh, uh, effort that uh, uh, to conduct this kind of analysis. Uh, the clinical outcomes uh, analysis uh, requires specific data query uh, to prepare clean uh, data and import it into the statistical tools. Uh, sometimes uh, they ask about um, uh, uh, what are the clinical outcomes uh, six months after the first diagnosis, for example, uh, because each patient uh, is diagnosed in different times. Uh, and uh, we have to calculate uh, when is the six months, when is the uh, one years uh, uh, of the of the data. So uh, of each uh, patient data. So so uh, it's mean that uh, we have to uh, manage uh, the data uh, 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 very carefully uh, to uh, provide uh, the clean data to the clinician so they can. Uh, uh, analyze uh, the data using the statistical tools. And we have, uh, of course, limited technical capabilities uh, amongst uh, team members, especially uh, we, we know that there is a, 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 
uh, uh, we can use the uh, R uh, software into the DIS2, but uh, up to now we haven't tried that. Uh, and maybe uh, one of you uh, have experience uh, working with that uh, and very appreciate if you can uh, share also with us uh, how to uh, conduct that part. And uh, in conclusions, um, uh, basically DIS2 can cover uh, all the requirements, uh, number of clinical uh, data management, uh, uh, even though that is only uh, fourth, but uh, we show that uh, even though that we add more disease, uh, the DIS2 can uh, accommodate uh, the requirements, all the requirements uh, of uh, the data elements. Uh, and uh, uh, clinical data management tools uh, should be used separately from electronic medical record uh, because uh, not all the the data from the medical record is uh, should be uh, collected uh, into the uh, 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 disease registrations uh, because uh, only specific uh, data and on and maybe uh, sometimes is only a specific times uh, uh, data uh, should be collected uh, in the the clinical uh, data registries. And of course, there are uh, many opportunity to extend the functionality of the AES2 uh, that we need to learn more. Uh, uh, our, uh, our challenge is uh, how to facilitate the clinical review process, uh, which is uh, more than one step yeah? uh, from the enumerators, data managers, and also uh, two clinicians should be reviewed the data before. Uh, it can be done, uh, it can be used for uh, analytics. Um, yes, I think uh, that's uh, our uh, presentations. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our works uh, in uh, Indonesia. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sanjay, for that uh, very interesting use case. Um, do we have any questions from the audience or online? Or if you're on Zoom, feel free to type it into the community of practice or Zoom. Um, if there are no questions, I can, uh, I can ask a couple and we can maybe try to start some conversation that way. Um, Dr. Sanjay, you mentioned some of these uh, advanced uh, statistical analyses that you're also doing with the disease registry. Um, could you uh, describe the process uh, for performing that type of analysis that you're currently doing and what type of analyses are most essential for your disease registry? Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, analyses is related to the survival analysis and uh, <clears throat> they want to see the outcomes of the uh, treatments yeah, uh, of a specific disease. Uh, this is uh, uh, happens in the cancer registry because the cancer registry actually already have their own systems using the Chanrec 5, I think similar like uh, Rwanda, uh, but uh, it is a standalone applications uh, that cannot be accessed by uh, many uh, users in, in different uh, organizations. So uh, the requirement is how to uh, export the data from the first uh, uh, first times uh, the patient is diagnosed until the uh, what uh, the clinical outcomes appears. Uh, for example, like um, yeah, uh, it can be that it can be recurrence, it can be uh, uh, many uh, others uh, outcome that defined by the clinicians. So we have to collect one by one. Uh, we have to uh, collect all the data. Uh, I mean, import the, uh, the data into uh, the spreadsheet, and then we uh, use the spreadsheet to to. Uh, uh, to get the specific uh, data that need to be uh, calculated in the survival analysis. Not all the data uh, uh, because uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, used for, for uh, uh, statistic analysis uh, because we only uh, choose uh, specific data and specific point of times uh, when the, uh, the, the clinical outcomes uh, appears. Uh, that we cannot do it in the 
uh, the AES to at the moment. Maybe we can we we can because we cannot because we don't have capacity to do so. Uh, so that's why we extract the data into the uh, Excel sheet or or uh, uh, comma separated value to to uh, clean the data again. Great, thank you for that. Yeah, maybe that's the next step that we could uh, work on in the future together. Um, anyone else with uh, questions maybe for the Resolve to Save Lives team? No? Um, yeah, it's the end of the day. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, 420 almost, so um, I won't uh, hold many people to the uh, experts' lounges, which are coming up next. But um, maybe, um, Joseph, could you... Um, Share a bit more about the um, the the process now. So, um, did the trainings that you did at the um, for these care providers? Um, it's great that they're very speedy. We said like one minute for doing follow up visits, four minutes for enrolling a patient. But how do you manage uh, or balance that um, need for speed with data quality? And are you finding any data quality issues with this uh, very quick enrollment process? Thanks, uh, Brian. So um, we are um, used to the fact that in Nigeria, the healthcare workers are transferred from one facility to another. And there's also high staff attrition as a result of maybe getting uh, better paying jobs. So one of the things we did with HISP and the Federal Ministry of Health was to ensure that the training, first of all, was done in a cascaded manner to ensure that we always have people with the capacity at the national and state and facility level then also we developed um, SOPs, standard operating procedures that we've um, provided to all the healthcare providers that will guide them in ensuring smooth um, data entry into DHIS2. Then all the states have uh, WhatsApp platforms and we have uh, staff embedded in this platform that help to answer queries on the go. And then almost every, uh, every week, we look at the DHIS2 platform and then pull out uh, findings and try to probe deeper to find out why a particular facility is not reporting or why they are not um, entering data as and when due. So these are measures we've put in place to ensure that there's continuous oversight and quality improvement. Great, very interesting uh, processes. And uh, I can't wait to see the, the documentation that's uh, written up, the review of the process of deploying DHIS2 tracker like this. I, uh, I think everyone's blood sugar is running a bit low right now. Um, so if, any more questions? Great, I look forward to hearing more on the community of practice. Uh, let's give it up for our speakers. And um, thanks again, we'll be in touch.